Welcome to The Advocate, where thought-provoking topics are discussed with no holds barred here on Plus TV Africa. We basically call a spade by its name. Today, I'm talking about the future of works in Nigeria and how productivity will matter more than hours put into works. Raymond speaks on time management and attention management. Ruth will be talking about black tax and the increasing struggles of millionaires to save. Why Felix runs up this conversation with advocacy on good governance. Sit back and relax after this break. We'll be here to dissect it all. Stay with us. The future of work. If there's one thing we should have picked in 2020 from COVID-19, it's how we must increase our flexibility and adaptability, especially with the way we work. We have seen several companies adopt the remote working structure, why a few traditional companies are struggling to keep up. I personally think that work has gone beyond 9 to 5, that is, resuming at 9 a.m. and closing at 5 p.m. In the coming years, employer time will no longer matter, as the workplace will be driven solely on productivity and not amount of hours put in the work. Prospective job seekers will begin to seek for companies that are flexible with their working system. What is the implication for CEOs and HR experts? We must now develop a new performance metric system that measures productivity and not by how many times I showed up in the office. Companies who do not quickly pivot into the realities of the future of work may soon begin to lose their greatest assets, which is her people. Wow, well, it's interesting. Um, the dynamics is changing. Right. And each time there is a revolution, either by pandemic mm. or by human thinking, what order or whatever. I don't want to even use that word, what order, because there are a lot of controversies mm -hmm. around this. But the long and short of everything is that we should try to evolve. Times have changed. Mm. We're in the what industrial revolution are we? What or what? revolution is going from manual autom uh, manual automation to remote automation. Mm. Yes. You know it started from human efforts yeah. to manual automation where yes. you have to go through um, mechanics of doing things to reduce efforts. But now it's even going beyond that one to remote automation. That means you can be somewhere and you'll be controlling something somewhere. So you don't have to be in a physical location. The idea of the advent of science and technology and in especially internet technology has broken the barrier of uh, connectivity of human resource. Before mm. you have to fly, sometimes you have to fly an expatriate down to your locality to do mm. something. But in this era, you don't even have to do that. Somebody can be somewhere and, and correcting something. Exactly. So yeah. Ruth, Ruth, I mean, what do you think? I mean, just as to what he said, I remember um, some firms in Nigeria had issues with um, millennials asking for opportunities to work from home. Now that COVID-19 happened mm. and everyone was forced to, to work from that. home mm. and they've seen that um, productivity really did not even drop. In fact, what even you can find increased. is that it increased. Mm. So there's, there's now the struggle of, in fact, most of these firms don't even want to read, um, ask their staff to return back to, return to the back office. Because they're saving a lot of money. Exactly. They're saving yeah. a lot of money. Um, <laughs> operating costs in that entire aspect has been removed. Mm. So all they just have to be um, concerned is how to ensure that the staff deliver. And one thing I always like to tell people is that millennials kind of, they like to own their jobs. True. They really like to own their jobs. They like to ensure that um, no one comes and tells them that they're not doing, they're not pulling their weights. Mm. And because of that sense of responsibility, everyone is able to work from home. And, and these days you find people applying for jobs in the US, and living here in Nigeria, you yeah. have people. I, have, I know some. I know some people that are working for companies in the UK and the US, and they are here in Nigeria, wow. any dollars, any foreign currencies, you know, and still able to deliver. So work has changed. COVID nineteen has changed the way we do our work, and I think companies that do not even companies that still work in the ways of the old would stand the stand the risk of losing quality hands because most I, I, I understand some I've spoken to some tech people in the past and they and they're like if you tell me to come to the office you know that I'm not going to work for you again mm -hmm. <laughs> so and they're not the only ones I've, I've met like that so awesome. let's quickly take um, Raymond what do you think about this you know just chiming your thoughts on that 
Yeah, so I think that the future of work, uh, in talking about the future of work, I think it's important for uh, people to understand that it's important to stay ahead of change. So what's happening now is that change is happening. Mm -hmm. um, I read when you, I had when you mentioned about people that have been swept, uh, swept off by, you know, by the situation. That's because they are not able to stay, you know, ahead of change. You mentioned about me measuring new metrics for measuring productivity. You know, most times people are very, some people are still very traditional about how their work is being done. They want to see you do it. They want to ensure you are standing up and sitting down when they want you to do it uh, without knowing that, you know, the world has completely, completely changed. But mm -hmm. I also understand why these traditional thinkers uh, have those challenges. You know, that let's also take away the fact that there is also this issue of comp competence. There's this issue of competence against discipline and accountability. So you also want to look at these three things. Someone is competent, but the person is not disciplined enough to keep to time. Uh, so you have to keep struggling you have to keep calling the person on phone. You have to, it's most times they just get, uh, go offline completely and they are not able, uh, they are not in touch as at when you need them. And they also don't get to um, uh, produce those results as when you need them. And it becomes a very big challenge with traditional thinkers. They also have to make do with uh, the fact that change is here. No matter how much you don't want mm. to accept it, if you want to, it's like pregnancy, you know, the more you want to keep it, surely by nine months, something has to happen. Thank and you so, so much, But we baby. need to start changing our, minds, our, our mind, mindset on how we accept the future of work to know that, you know, you can actually do more, you know, by the way it was done originally. Thank you so much. So change is here and we've got to find new ways to really um, focus on productivity and then increase um, our metrics or how we measure actual work, you know, as opposed to, you know, just hours of work. So up next is Raymond. Please do stay with us. Attention management versus time management. Over the years, there has been this cliche and consistent teaching from motivational speakers and thought leaders about managing our time. I believe in that concept and I invest so much in making sure I make the best use of my time. But as we all know, the world is changing at a very unprecedented rate and greatly affects our ability to manage our time effectively. There is a saying that movement is not always equal to progress. This is true because we all have the same number of hours in a day and do so much to ensure we come out stops with the results on a daily basis. According to Sabri Subi in his book, Sell Like Crazy, being busy is, is not the same as being productive. Our lives are full of distractions, and it's hard to stay focused when the world consists of hundreds of tiny tasks and millions of so voices screaming for your attention. Again, the current jet age of the internet and social media make it difficult to manage time, so we easily get engrossed scrolling through several content, which usually end up not producing the kind of result we had originally set out to achieve. On the other hand, deciding what exactly we want to do and focusing all your attention will lead to hitting goals faster than trying to use your time as a yardstick. And this is why I believe that we should channel our energy to manage the things we pay attention to instead of the time we all have which will never change anyway. Today, we live in a world where we have the ability to achieve so many results. If only we can shut down all the external forces constantly craving our attention. The truth is that you have in you right now all the resources, knowledge, skills, and network we need to do, <laughs> like in the Nigerian parlance, right? But you are giving attention to the wrong things. That's the problem we have. You have believed that you have a low attention span so much that you are now scattering the one you have, and there is, that is where the problem is. The fact remains that there will never be any significant result paying maximum attention to the wrong things, never. Through research and studies, I have become more particular about the short attention span of human beings. And that perspective taught me that perhaps the most critical factor in, is our ability to control the things we pay attention to. Perhaps when we start focusing more on the things we pay attention to, we may just need to worry less about the time we have to achieve all we need. We have, in the end, 
it's a matter more about how well talking about attention and not how long talking about duration life coach this is where you come in <laughs> uh, <strategies>. well, yeah. <laughs> okay so well, i think this is a very profound um thought right from raymond you know um there's been a lot of um commissions around you know time management and attention management of course you know and um it's not just about like he ended with his thoughts it's not just about how long but how well exactly. you know there's this um parito principle the 80 20 rule 20 percent you, know, yeah. you know of um 20 percent of the work creates 80 percent of the result you know so mm -hmm. i think it's the ability to find i always say that being busy is doesn't amount to productivity you can be busy and not productive so it's not that i'm busy what are you busy on right being able to find out what are the important things in your life that creates you know the highest impact and then shifting your focus on that i think time is living its life right time is just moving doing when people say oh um i, I, I didn't do time. this because of, i don't have time we all have time <laughs> time is living its life so i think we should all also live our lives so what we do is to pattern our lives according to time mm -hmm. right I mean, by the time we're done with you know with this conversation the time would have gone beyond what it was now yes. so so it's really about finding those high impact stuff and then zeroing in our energy on that i think in addition to that um whilst we find the high impact stuff it's important that we also remove <laughs> or consciously remove the low impact stuff True. because i mean there's that's there's there's the consciousness or there's an assumption that we feel like okay once i once i'm focusing on the high impact stuff the low impact stuff are not just going to be there anymore but you know you have to consciously tell yourself i'm not going to do certain things mm. sometimes it might even be as responding to certain meals that are not urgent and mm. important at mm. that point in time there's there's this chat that i, I remember being taught some time ago yeah. um urgent urgent versus important. importance yeah. yes and so you pick the, the four exactly the four yeah. quadrants so it's it's important to find where you play at any point in time and understand the activities that you do that will help you yield the results that you want in life because at the end of the day like like raymond mentioned we have just time would never change mm. it's going to always be 24 hours every day forever so we just have to learn to maximize that 24 hours that we have in a day to achieve whatever it is we want to do just before well, elijah chimes in sorry elijah to call <laughs> in. so i remember this now nobody say in my all my training sessions i'd always say that you know when we were born we had 24 hours right and our job description was just to maybe cry sleep eat food and then we, we grew further you know the jd added we're running errands for our parents and all the stuff we grew further we went to school we have to be more responsible and all those things yeah within the same duration within the same hour, <laughs> yeah. 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 So our time never increased so here's what yeah. i got from the intelligence there is that you know to be more effective in life we yeah. need to be more efficient and exactly. efficiency is doing more with less time, less time. With less time. Less time. give you more time exactly you figure out how to do more with less Sure. Yeah. I, I see we all read the same literature. <laughs> you quoted 8020 rule from Brian Tracy's book. You also quoted urgency, the quadrant urgency, important, yeah. mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. important, and other things. But what I'm going to say is that we should always learn to work smart, not ha not necessarily hard. First things first, there's the obvious waste of time. There are some people that actually sit down and do nothing, perhaps engage in unproductive activities. That one is very obvious. But I want to come to the soft two aspects. The software aspect is that there's some person that are actually doing something good, which is great. If they don't do it, they won't put food on their table. But the mannerism in which they go about it is sapping a lot of energy, energy time. one, yeah. and taking more time. It's not efficient. Exactly. So it's up to, to them now, they are working hard. And there's a saying that goes that if you do what you always do, you get what you always get. Mm -hmm. And every day they keep moving in cycle. Every year they keep doing this the same way. They sweat and toy, but no, no growth. But yeah, they are doing something great. And if they don't do it, Perhaps their family will not feed, but then they have to be subtle about it. That's where smart words come in. How can I introduce some other mannerism? It could be maybe some machineries or delegation or some things you need to subtly engage. Or maybe there are some aspect of the work, work you are doing that you think you should not do again because the outcome is not uh, reasonable. Mm -hmm. So these are things you need to consider so that you have enough time to do less and have time to rest. And also think I, about something I, I think for I think for me, I just quickly before you wrap up, I think again the thing is is all also not really about the time we have. It's more about our clarity about um on what we need to do with the time that we have. Yeah, you know, most yeah. like two people have two hours to finish a job, 
one person has to shuttle or try to multitask and know around seven things at the same time, which is fantastic if you have that ability. But I can assure you that one person who zeroes their mind to do one thing per time will have increased, increased focus, will have increased energy, and will automatically come out with a better result more than the person and in lesser time he will finish the seven task in lesser time more than the person who was shuttling down and doing this and doing that all within the same time time interval i think people should we should really start focusing on more on what we put our attention on not about i need to achieve this in two hours no this is what you need to achieve you need to achieve this i need to achieve this i need to achieve and not the duration that you need to achieve them and you think is if you start thinking in this manner then we'll start spotting the things that sap our time that eat mm -hmm. into our time because immediately you want to press your phone your conscious subconscious reminds you that this is not what you should be paying attention to Raymond, let me just add this before you go there's this popular uh, there's this quote from brian tracy i love so much from eat that frog he said there is no need of budging worry being worried about tadpoles when there is a live big frog waiting to be eaten mm. think about that mm. a live big frog in the place you need to swallow the frog and you're bothered about tadpoles when you swallow the frog you are just going to be okay the tadpole will not will, will actually sort out themselves he mentioned something around attention mind yes, you want to talk about yes, that exactly i was going to say something around that so um it's important that i mean i there's the saying that women multitask better than guys, right? So I tend to multitask. <laughs> 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 I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so, um, but in, in the pace of multitasking, you have to understand that if I have two hours to achieve five engagements or five tasks, I must ensure that for whatever one minute or two minutes or five minutes, I have to exactly. give to a particular tax. I'm doing exactly. it without thinking of something else. Hundred percent. Has to be focused. Yes, mm. yes laser focus. Exactly. It has to be focused. Ensure that I'm able to deliver within that short space of time, and then I could spread it alongside. Because you know, you are here. You are doing one work. Yeah. You are chatting on the phone. <laughs> and you know, the beautiful thing is now that we all work laptops and all. You have your WhatsApp, WhatsApp web, open, Telegram, WhatsApp yeah, web, Telegram, you know, open everything all at the same time exactly, and so you you be responding to messages while you are typing a mail. <laughs> you just proved like a powerful <laughs> woman that you are. And, <laughs> <laughs> and in most cases, it affects the quality of our work. Finally, exactly, exactly. Very true. You know, attention span is really, really, really dropping. Um, so Raymond, that was really a very you know um, thoughtful um, stuff because. Again, people go on Instagram and then they are scrolling very fast. So attention span is really, really reducing. Again, there's this field in marketing that talks about once you can control people's attention, yes. you can yeah. control their emotions, exactly. then you yeah. can create that trigger to buy from you. I can't yeah. even control their perception, life, everything. <laughs> you have you have everything. So, <laughs> buy people's, so you need to, you need to wake up and go, now. <laughs> want to buy your attention. You need to buy people's attention. Exactly. And that's what brands successfully do, to buy attention of people. Yeah. You know, Perception. Yeah. Engaging control, videos. Influence. Exactly. Stuff like that. Exactly. Yes. So they have manipulation too. Of course, well, at the end of the day, <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, you, you make me buy what I never wanted to buy in the first place. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, I was manipulated. Right. Okay, so Raymond, yeah, you can close out. All right, Ruth is next after the break. So I'll be talking of black tax and savings. Um, if there's one thing I know many millennials are struggling with when it comes to savings is black tax. Black tax refers to the financial support which is expected of any working class individual by their families. While some see this as an obligation, others don't. Some do it with joy, others don't. The problem with the situation is that for our parents, they didn't have the benefits of the current pension scheme which came up through the pension reform of 2004. Hence, they really do, do not have so much to fall back to after, or did not have so much to fall back to after their retirement. I hope this won't be the case for my generation when we get to that age or th the age of our parents. Also, income level in Nigeria is so low, with the minimum wage for civil servants at 30,000 naira. 
when you add that to the black tax situation, people are left with nothing or little or nothing to save. The problem with black tax is that it can be impromptu, it can be unplanned. So all that you saved can be spent on solving a particular issue. So the question is, what can be done? I believe this is where financial planning comes into play. Saving through voluntary pension contributions, um, mutual funds, and even taking bets on local international stock markets would help a young person while he meets, or she rather, meets his or her black tax obligation. So what do you wow. guys think? You're a finance <laughs> professional par excellence. <laughs> when you are talking about black tax from research, Black tax did far some years back in South Africa. Yes. The issue of um, the emancipation of the black community when they begin to get white collar job, mm -hmm. blue collar job, even mm -hmm. different collar job. Mm -hmm. For those of you that understand this, <laughs> I do have the life coach is looking at me of that. So what I'm saying is that you know many of them were leaving the villages to yeah. cities and towns to take up jobs mm -hmm. as clerk, um, what do you call them, secretaries, what have you, mm -hmm. and craftsmen. So the little they get by way of entitlement kind of the family the family was like okay i have someone in town i know he's going to send this oh the so -so person needs to pay our school fees oh we need to buy this we need to do that so the person on his own will be blackmailed emotionally into doing that because even if it, it is not convenient he will not he or she will not feel comfortable so that's where the the story the um, origination or the origin of a black tax rather but over years the world has adopted that term black tax from South Africa. So black tax now, anybody. Now there's another research that said that some migrants, especially is common among blacks um, in countries like US, UK and what have you, when they migrate down, there's always high expectation from people back home. Oh, exactly. I have a brother in Canada or a sister in America. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. she will send me a hundred dollars. But you don't know what they are passing through. To get that. To get exactly. that. So, but you just feel entitled to do okay, because I have someone outside. Mm -hmm. The person was always send me money. And that's why they said, this is the consequence of not having a lot of this migrant building generational worlds. If mm. you calculate the number of, um, sorry I'm using this terminology, but I just have to use it to explain it. If you go to countries like America, the um, white community, they have more, the percentages of the rich are always more compared to the black because of things like this. So it's, it's now like boils down to the social construct. How can the government, through meaningful institutions, solve the problem of poverty because it boils down to poverty? If social amenities are put into place and proper sensitization, people will not really bother much, especially young people trying to get a job about their parents or so, because somehow the society will take care of its own. Mm. So that's the problem. And another thing again is, how can institutions like the stock exchange, for instance, various financial market exchange, sensitize the public, especially here in Nigeria. Like for instance, everybody, young persons know about cryptocurrency, they know about forex trading and all those things. But if you talk about the Nigerian stock, they don't even understand, them. they don't know anything about it. Many of us, or many of them, or yeah, many of us, we don't know anything about it. <laughs> we, don't, we don't even have faith in it. For a few of us that even know in some things about it, we do, we say, oh, anything in Nigeria, we don't believe it mm. in our country. And it's not supposed to be because mm -hmm. Nigeria is a great country. Mm -hmm. How can the government provide an enabling environment and people will understand this and that, okay, I can be working somewhere, but I can have, I can buy in bonds, I can buy company shares, I can invest in this market, I can, maybe my pensions can go into mutual fund and why the government try to struggle with or try to provide the basic amenities so that the life will be easy for everyone. So these are things, these are the conversations mm. to have around it. You know, Ruth, I mean, we're talking about this you yes. know, when we're coming down mm -hmm. here. The, the truth is, like I, I shared with you privately, right? The truth is, and I love the way you ended you know, your thoughts, which is financial planning, right? I mean, I've said to myself that I'm so, so, so um, laser focused on my savings culture, right? Nothing ain't going to come in between me and my savings. It's like my baby girl. <laughs> so nothing comes in between my savings, right? And I think the more, because the truth is, family would always be there. And the extreme side of that could be entitlement. Yes. Where, you know, it happens with this whole elder elder child kind of thingy. The elder child has to, to bear the burden for everybody. everyone. Everybody. And what happens exactly. is, elder child does that. And then over the years, the elder child person. begins to become grumpy, mm -hmm. become begins to complain because, you know, down the years, his or her life hasn't amounted into any significance, right? Yeah. So I think it's about, so if you're earning 30K, right? You know, you say I'm saving 30% of 30K. 
right? So when you're now earning 300K and you do 30%, the, the monies are going to be different. Mm -hmm. So it's about that consistency. So you don't say, oh, I'm earning 300K now. Oh, let me reduce it <laughs> to 2% because I'm earning much more. So it's about maintaining that consistency because the truth is, well, how I know they finish, right? <laughs> there are always be problems. So exactly. there will always be problems. So it's you saying, listen, you know, I'm, I'm going to share something with personal. So we're making like a family contribution. And then my mom told me that, you know, so you're going to, you know, draw 50K this month. I said, mom, I'm not doing this, right? I've purchased something, you know, and I'm going to do my own contribution next month. And I'm going to add something next uh, to it. She was like, oh, please, please. I said, mom, you aren't going to, you know, blackmail me or something. I am I'm fixed on this. I'm looking at my savings sheet. I, I, like I have like an Excel sheet where I track everything, right? So no confusion. So I think it's about that financial planning, right? And then keep putting. So if you are consistently giving somebody 10K every month, it's better than 10K this month and then 50K after two years. No, consistency. consistency. And when you Plan. grow, you are transparent. You see that you've grown in your income. You're giving them 10K. Now you're giving them 30K. Now you're giving them 50K. You're giving them 100K. That's that growth. And they see you as someone that is really, really, you know, intentional with your finance. Money, money, I like everything revolves around money. Money is a centerpiece of life. And we've got to be careful how we really build a relationship with money. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I was just even thinking around everything everyone was saying. And I think the, the thoughts that keeps coming to my mind is that um, at the end of the day, there would always be something that you have to do mm. for your family. That I was even sounds, telling you the other day that sometimes you just even have to think of yourself. Very true. Self-care. Yes. I want to share an experience. So I want to share an experience because I've been laughing since... You know, since uh, she, she, um, Ruth was sharing her opinion, and I'm, I'm laughing so hard here. My cheek is, uh, my cheeks are hurting because here Sorry I, about am that, <laughs> I am here in Cyprus, and I have an experience, a first hand experience of what you guys are saying. And so, so first thing I want to say is that you see, problems will always be there, family will always be there, right? So it boils down on your own personal decision and your own personal goal. Before I traveled abroad, something very significant happened. And I want to share this for people that it might just inspire and all that. So I came back from a trip one time. I traveled abroad. I came back from a trip. And then I called my entire family and I told them, see, I want to embark on a project. I know this person is sick. This person is this. This person is that. Uh, house rent needs to be paid, blah, 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 and all those. I say, I know all these things are there. But you people see, I have money. It's not like I don't have money. Look at the kind of money, the amount of money I have. But you see this money. Even if anybody is dying now, <laughs> I'm not going to take out any tenkobo from this. I said, I can get emotional and give you, take you to the hospital, give this person, give this person. I said, the consequence is that in the next two years, all of us are still going to be on the same level. Mm. And so I zeroed my mind, and for the first time, I spent three good months. I never looked right, I never looked left. I did not give anybody any time until three months I traveled abroad. But what was the consequence was that by the time they left me alone, I had more focus, I had more energy, I had more you know, capacity, I could do more for myself, such that when it was time for me to leave the country, I had enough money to give them so that they will not even be able to disturb me in the next six months. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So it's on two ways. First is from the individual that is being black taxed. What are your goals? Because the truth is that if you are not able to achieve your goals, you are still going to have your own self to blame. Nobody is going to bear that consequence for you. Nobody is going mm -hmm. to feel bad for you. It is you who knows the vision and the goal and the dreams you have for yourself. I always tell people that, listen, if you die right now, those people will find an alternative. And I told them, see, it went to so bad, I had to even look at my mom in the face. I say, see, if anybody dies now, the person is losing in advance. If you decide to die right now, you're losing in advance. So you better <laughs> be alive and watch me get to where I'm going. So what I'm saying is that for us as millennials, for us as young people, yes, we cannot afford to look away from our responsibilities. But we also need to start planning around those responsibilities. Because, um, like Onyekre, Victor gave an instance, if you're earning 30,000 Naira, you have to plan around 30,000 Naira. And perhaps your um, salary scales up to 100,000 Naira. You also need to plan around 30,000 Naira, uh, around 100,000 Naira. Not that it now gets to 100,000 Naira, you are giving 5% before, and now it's 100,000. You now quickly started giving 
you know, 50% of the money because you feel like the money is high. There is this principle that says that in this life, uh, I've forgotten the name of that principle, but it says that once people's income starts increasing, Taxes. automatically their need also starts going exactly. up with it. Exactly. Exactly. And so if you are not able to plan around those things, then you're going to have a lot of problems. So exactly. here I am laughing because this is a problem for people. And let me also say this. There is also this pressure pressure not to be called a bad person mm. pressure not to be not to be labeled not to be labeled as irresponsible in fact i had an uncle that called me and said that uh, he had a, he had that i've not been uh, uh, taking care of my siblings i've not been doing this what kind of irresponsibility is that by the time he was telling me this i was already like two days away living to nigeria and i just smiled i did not have any explanation to give to him so black task will always be there but you must not allow it to pressure you into not achieving your goal you must have your savings any day you stop saving you don't have any dime in your account they are going to survive they are going to find an alternative they are going to find another person in fact you will not even matter because the things that made them to come close to you was because you had those resources and so you must do everything to ensure that you always have don't forget even this um, holy book will always say that to him who has more is going to be given to the person. Your mm -hmm. ability to save means that you have the capacity to attract more resources. And anytime you start getting broke, forget it. The one you have, they will sack all of them, and all of you will still be at the same level. And let mm -hmm. me also end with this. I had a very you know, powerful man who said something, that two people that are at the same level can never help themselves. Yeah. And so it has to take one person to come up, no matter what it means, even if it means you stepping on that person, that the, the other person, even if it means you coming up, but with the intention that by the time you are up, you can stretch out your hand and pull this person up. If that doesn't happen, then all of us are going to be at the same level. And we'll be seeing black, black task as a bad thing or as a negative thing just because we did not take responsibility of our savings culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Raymond. I think uh, just to put context to what he's just said, the I think the quote is, Two poor people cannot help themselves. Mm. So I always tell people, <laughs> you have to help yourself to be rich so that you can also help somebody else to be rich. Mm. Um, and I, I think just before I round off on this conversation, um, I feel like it's important to also mention this. Like, we cannot neglect our responsibilities, especially when it comes yeah. to parents. Because me, I, mm. I'm very personal when it comes to my parents. We cannot yeah. neglect that responsibility. One thing I, 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 I suggest for people to do is, Take insurance, especially health insurance for your parents, because that 50,000 era health insurance can save you a 100,000 era bill. Mm. So yeah. I, I took health insurance for my, for my mom at one point, and she needed to change her glasses. She needed to go to the hospital. I didn't have to remove a dime mm. from my pocket, which on, I would have actually spent that and more on that. So I feel like there's, there's so many of these HMOs now that are um given opportunities for insurance knowing fully well that health is something that our parents are subject to so we need to take health insurance so um right now felix is going to be the next after the break good governance the what and how the word governance derives ultimately from the greek verb kubaneo meaning to stare it's occasional use in English to refer to the specific activity of ruling a country. According to Wikipedia, governance is all the processes of interaction, be they through laws, norms, power or language of an organized society over a social system, be they family, tribe, formal or informal organization, territory or across territories. Governance objective the main function or aim a governance system tends to achieve, be it of a country, society, or an organization, is summarized by the following. Decision-making, creation of laws or constitution, enforcement, creation of access, occasional management of resources, justice delivery, security. Achieving good governance. Good governance is a guarantee of the expectation of the governed. It employs fairness and upholding common values above individual interests. Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., the 46th and current president of the United States, once said that fighting corruption is not just good governance, it's self-defense, it's patriotism. 
This means that everyone, from those in the position of authority or in the government to those at the grassroots level in a nation, should make it their personal responsibility to protect their nation or society from the shackles of parochialism, self-aggrandizement, and personal gain at the expense of common national values and progress. In order for a governance system to be viewed as good for its people, the following should be attained. Empathy in dealing with different constituents of the governed. There should be a healthy balance between equity and equality, inclusiveness and fairness. No national of a nation is more national than any other national of that nation, both within and outside the reach of that nation. Putting it in local context, no Nigerian is more Nigerian than any other Nigerian, both within and outside Nigeria. Thus, good governance should ensure that every constituent of the governed is respected and factored in fairly in decision-making and planning. Provision of enabling environments, high integrity quotients and transparency, open to constructive criticism and feedback, building strong institutions. In conclusion, let us ponder on these words of Raghuram Rajan, former governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Strong government does not mean simply military power or an efficient intelligence apparatus. Instead, it should be mean, effective, fair administration. In other words, good governance. When you talk about good governance, I think... <laughs> My experience, I've not had good governance since I was born. <laughs> so, it, I mean, I've not experienced one, let me put it that way. I've seen it in other countries, you know, but I've not experienced one. And it's unfortunate, right? Mm -hmm. um, very much unfortunate. Every patriotic Nigerian wants to see a better Nigeria. Every patriotic Nigerian wants, to, wants the fact that whoever I'm, I'm putting into um, voting for, um, in that election would give returns on or, or would deliver on all the things that he's promised, he, him or her has promised, right? So it becomes, it begs us, begs the problem that, you know, we don't get to see um, good governance in Nigeria, which is so unfortunate. Um, we, see, we, we always refer to countries like Singapore, refer to countries like, um, what is it, even the United States, and we always want to become like them, but we realize that the foundation is that we have to ensure, we have to be conscious of the fact that we are putting in the right people in power. That mm. way, we can then demand for good governance. And also, there's a thing of where we, most times, we tend not to even demand for good governance. We assume that we will get it, but it doesn't happen. Mm. Sometimes you just have to demand for good governance, and it's our rights as citizens of a country to demand for good governance. I feel your concern. I feel your concern because we're in this situation. I believe that good governance is a process. So I'm going to, I want to specifically throw two um, pointers to Victor and the Raymond's conversation. Victor, you're a, you're a life coach, and most times you deal with um, feedback, constructive criticism, and feedback. How can you? What can you see in this situation where the government of Nigeria, from as seen by various administrations? before this current one, find it difficult to deal with um, feedback. In this case, feedback would come in terms of maybe social media banter or protest. There, are, there is always a recurring decimal with regard to we don't want to no feedback. The next thing is we send the law enforcement agent to clamp them down. So what can you say about the government? And then the next thing is that Raymond is going to talk more about um, creating an enabling environment, especially for the offshoot of tech technology, young people participating in tech. So, Victor, I want to hear your yeah, thoughts on thank that. Thank you so much, Elijah. You know, um, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> so when people taste power, I mean, I was speaking to a young chap, and I said, listen, if you get in there, you know, how are you sure you're going to make a difference, really? Right? Yeah. We don't know. You know, when you squeeze something, I said that before, when you squeeze something, when something goes through pressure, okay. the real content comes out. Thank so you. you don't even know if you are corrupt until you taste power all right so we can just be tweeting oh we need to get the old guys out you know and everything but when you get in there i mean look at the answers and all of that like there was division even with answers you know some people were for this group so we are for this group who started the answer i mean it was just a war around who started the answers movement who cares about who started it right so someone is trying to say oh i am the 
pioneer on the initiative of NSAS. This is just NSAS. So what if what you have become the, 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 the governor or the president? I mean, so I, I think why um, most um, of our leaders in power do not t take feedback very, you know, um, in good faith or seriously might be from what I said earlier, which is, you know, when you taste power. And it goes back to personal values. Family is the smallest unit of a nation. You know, cell is the smallest unit of life. To fix, you know, the societal decadence, the moral decadence, the governance decadence, we need to go back to family. Because the guys that couldn't pass WAEC, the guys that jumped fence in class, the guys that are, you know, terrorizing people in the streets, young guys, that ones that will end up in power in the next few years. So if we don't do something about it, if we don't fix that values from the grassroots, then they're going to go run for power. And they say, I mean, I mean, bad things continue to happen when good people do nothing. Yeah. You know, so because of the way the, the, the polity is so um, structured, good people do not want to go risk their lives, right? So what happens is the guy that couldn't pass jump, the guy that couldn't pass work, the guy that was a dropout would end up becoming the governor. And what happens? What kind of values has he built, you know, or has he or she built, you know, from that fundamental? So let's go back to the roots, to the fundamentals, the grassroots, and begin to inculcate proper value system. And I think that, that that's how we can begin to create that chain of good governance. Can I say something? Uh, sure, 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 sure. Raymond, just hold on a bit for before you respond. The lady wants to say something. <laughs> See, I mean, in addition to all Victor said, I, I'm thinking we need to build institutions. True. Because the truth is, um, mm. regardless mm. of whether you bring in, I mean, if you take this crop of politicians to a country that has solid institutions, they would not. They would survive. They would not survive. They would not be corrupt. Mm. Wow. They would not do anything because they know the consequences of their actions. Sure. And it's the same thing. I mean, we are human. But I just love you right now for saying that. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, I, I, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday, and I mean, a senior person, and she was saying that because it was a struggle around a particular person. And she said, she said something that actually struck me. She said, you know, the issue room. that we have with this the person, you can also do the same thing if we don't put structure. And then just help you understand the fact that we need to ensure that we set up structures, build institutions that can help us push what we want in terms of um, a corruption-free economy mm -hmm. and in terms of holding people accountable to whatever it is that they promise um, the electorate. Yeah. So, so let me say something very quickly. I'm very excited to talk about this. Uh, for one, I am one person that never, ever, ever shout about corruption. I don't believe there is corruption. I don't believe that. I simply believe that there are no consequences for action. You know, all over, everywhere in the world, we have corruption. I mean, I've been privileged to travel to 14 countries. And all these countries, none of them is an angel. None of them have sent field governance. But the, the difference is that they have set up system to ensure that people are severely or adequately punished for every action, for every decision, right? I think the problem we have back home in Nigeria is that there are no consequences for action. And it's not just about, you know, the people in government. And, and I think we also need to, because these days when they talk about corruption, people think it's about the politician that was elected for three, three, four years ago. No. Corruption is about the driver who jumps the traffic lights. Corruption is about the individual who is asking for money before he can submit a file. Corruption is about the policeman on the road who saw somebody with a device, a gadget, a laptop, and is asking the person to give money or else is threatening to kill the person. Okay. Corruption. Uh, Raymond, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, it's important that we build strong institutions that can stand the test of time beyond individual sentiments because if we focus more on the individuals we sabotage the system so the institution is more important than the individual join us again next week on another edition of the advocates the advocacy the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on facebook at plus tv africa hashtag the advocate ng and instagram at plus tv africa hashtag the advocate ng to, to catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com slash theadvocateng. 
don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel plus tv africa join us next week same time the station let's keep advocating for a better society